are talking men's health today, erectile dysfunction, and a healthy heart. And our guest is Dr. Richard Natale. He is with Carolina Urology Partners. He's a men's health specialist and urologist in the Charlotte, North Carolina region. Why don't you tell listeners a little bit about who you are and your background as a urologist and why you chose this field? All right. Well, thanks for having me. My name is uh, Richard Natale. I'm a urologist, as you uh, so eloquently said, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Originally from California, born and raised, and did my training mostly in the East Coast uh, region, finishing up my urology training in 2009 at University of Florida, uh, moving into the Charlotte area right after I graduated and, and setting up my practice with my partners out in, uh, in the suburbs of Charlotte. Urology, why did I pick it? I think Urology is a very interesting field, very diverse. You can spend all day in clinic or you can spend all day in an operating room. You can use a scalpel, you can use a laser, um, you can use medications. We are uh, kind of multifaceted and that's a really neat part about our job is that we're not just kind of pigeonholed into one sort of uh, procedure or one sort of kind of uh, training of, uh, uh, of our uh, uh, in medicine, we are kind of jack of all trades within our within our specialty. And I like that. Um, with that being said, we also have the ability then to focus in on something that's more interesting to us. Uh, for me, it's been men's health, uh, being a men's health advocate and taking care of patients who have issues that they that they need addressed. Um, being their champion, being their voice, has been uh, something that I really really enjoy. Um, so that is why I get got into the field. Um, that's kind of a nutshell about me and the in the things I like. And I'm glad to I, I, I'm glad I picked this field. Yeah. And what does being a men's health advocate mean to you? I think it really is about standing up for guys and really speaking on the issues that affect them specifically. That maybe they're not willing or able or feel comfortable about talking about openly. Right. I think. If you look at things like erectile dysfunction, for example, it is a it's difficult for men to to speak to other men, let alone their spouses or other people in the community, the physicians, to get that help, right? So you need to have someone who's willing to kind of make that conversation easier and um, focus on on alleviating the problems that are associated with that, the medical, the the physical, the, the psychological impact that those things have you need someone who can be your champion and um that's that's what i think what what it means to be the men's health advocate um and it really doesn't just pertain just to erections obviously other issues but um, erections are a big one of them well i do want to ask about erectile dysfunction and heart disease today so please just let's start this conversation with you explaining or defining erectile dysfunction so Think of, of this, the uh, penis is comprised of two um, almost like cylindrical dish sponges, right? And uh, that you just buy them from the grocery store with their plastic wrap uh, still on them. Blood flows in, the sponge expands, the plastic wrap tightens, we get an erection. Um, and then the process, of course, reverses itself. When you look at erectile dysfunction, it really is a disturbance and obviously that basic function. And whether or not it's an all the time thing, whether it's not a a complete, you know, black and white, off and on types phenomenon. No, it, it can be as simple as, gee, every now and again, I'm having troubles. I struggle. Um, I can't get it as as erect as I used to, or I can't uh, maintain it. Those are all definitions of erectile dysfunction. It, it is not getting what you need when you need it for as long as you need it to complete the job. Um, and when you look at it that way, then you can realize that there's probably something in the order of 30 million men in the United States who deal with this issue. That's a great reason to be having this conversation today. And heart disease, we know it's so prevalent. And so how is erectile dysfunction connected to heart disease? Well, I'll tell you, I, um, I joke with my patients that uh, the penis is the canary in the coal mine, right? So, you know, coal miners used to put canaries down in the caves to see how much carbon monoxide in, in, uh, was in the caves. And obviously they would know if it was safe to go digging. Um, if you look, the penis is that. Um, the blood vessels that supply our penis are smaller than the cardiac blood vessels. 
Um, and it's kind of like the first thing to go, so to speak. There were some pretty robust studies that have been done over the last 20 years that have linked the onset of ED to the development of coronary artery disease as a, a is you know in 20 percent or more of men so guys who come in for example to my office and i you know i look and say gee they may have some risk factors let's say they're smokers or they have a family history or high blood pressure uh high cholesterol they come in with a primary complaint of ed i make mention to them that they ought to think about some sort of evaluation for the primary care doc because that association is powerful enough that we realize that there's a chance that this is just the first uh, the first chip to fall. What comes first, the heart problems or the erectile dysfunction? Yeah, I you know I'll be honest with you. I'm surprised when more men come to me with I was fine until my heart surgery or I was fine until my med heart attack or whatever the circumstance is. Usually, I would I would hazard a guess that oftentimes that's coming first. The ED is coming first. With that being said. Um, some men do maintain fairly good erections, and they start developing those other issues, the you know, the heart attacks or the or all the rest, and they start seeing that decline in their function, oftentimes tied into medications as well. So you'll see guys who say, you know, I, I G doc, I I had a heart attack um, last year, and my doctor put a stent in. I'm I'm doing good, but they started me on this drug metoprolol, and between that and 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 you know, the previous issues with my, with my heart, I'm really having a struggle with erections. So usually we see the the erectile dysfunction um, predate the cardiac stuff, but not all the time. We'll tell you, um, I did have a patient that I saw in the beginning of my practice a decade ago, and I was able to look at my old notes from a decade ago, more. And in that notes, I said that exact discussion we're having right now, I said, to him and I made mention you need to go get a cardiac screening. He came back a decade later. At that time he had had mild ED. Came back a decade later and had had an open heart surgery. He was about 50 something years old at this point and it just kind of fell on the statistics and it was impressive to see because I had made mention to him years ago he needs to be screened and, and lo and behold he wound up having troubles. In doing some research before we got on the podcast today, I had read there are five currently five FDA-approved treatment options for erectile dysfunction. Can you tell us about what those five treatment options are? Um, so the first and foremost, the drugs that we use to get the blood flow jump-started that everybody's heard about or knows about, that's treatment option kind of number one. In fact, that's that's the most commonly used treatment option in the United States. Now, after that, um, if you look, there is there is a pellet suppository. It looks like a small grain of, of, salt, of uh, sand. It's inserted in the urethra channel, it dissolves, and can give us erections. It was a much more popular prescription option before the oral medications. In my practice, I've probably written a handful, at maybe, and it's mostly been refills. And that's simply because... They're not quite as effective as the oral medications. They're a little bit more uncomfortable, obviously, to give. And they may cause burning and irritation to yourself or your spouse. So don't use that a whole bunch. Um, I do use uh, penile injections. Uh, penile injections are another option to help get the erection that we need. Very commonly prescribed in the United States, oftentimes done with a combination of different medications. Um, but the injections are what it sounds like, a needle in the penis and gets the blood flow going. Um, vacuum pumps are another, uh, as I joke with my patients, some uh, maybe more bang for the buck, so to speak. So it's a, you know, a investment in a, in a pump that will you, you put around the penis, you, you draw the blood in and trap it in, usually with a band that, that holds the blood in. Um, and you know, obviously, again, you're not spending money monthly. Hopefully, you're buying one device that should last for some time. And then I, I use this. Uh, I listed not as the last but not least, but I listed as uh, just in this order is penile implants. Uh, penile implants being a corrective measure for ED. So the others are treating, right? The, you got to use them every time you want to have intercourse. Penile implants are the way we fix the problem. 
Okay, one by one now with these five FDA-approved treatment options, I am going to ask you about the risks and benefits of each so it's pretty clear to our listeners. Uh, I'll start with oral medications. Why don't you tell us first about the benefit and then the risk? I think the benefit really is that, you know, easy, um, we can find them anywhere nowadays, believe it or not, pretty darn cheap, generic, um, simple, um, effective. So I think those are great ways to get get the ball rolling, so to speak. Um, definitely easy to use, as I said. I think that the drawbacks or the, the kind of side effects um, and interactions they may have with medications. Side effects are tolerable, usually flat facial flushing, maybe headache, uh, stuffy nose, in some instances, nausea or reflux feeling. Um, some people will get muscle cramps and aches. Occasionally, we'll have guys who complain about feeling like their heart's racing some. Um, those are all very normal side effects to the medication, mostly tolerable. But the big thing is really is the interaction with medication because you may actually experience very unsafe drops in your blood pressure. So we got to be careful about that. And that's probably the biggest drawback, I think, of the medications is that interaction potential. Injection therapy. Can you tell us about the risk and benefits there? So the injection therapy is a little bit... Interesting. You know, from a from a therapeutic kind of success standpoint, it's great. I, I know that I can dial up the medication to what I need to to treat most men. Very effective. Um, you know, the biggest drawback is is what we all feel, which is a needle, right? There's a needle down there. Now it's not in the most sensitive of areas, it's not on the head of the penis or or somewhere it's gonna be very, very uncomfortable. Um, but nevertheless, you still gotta get over the idea that you're gonna that you will be self-administering a shot in your penis every time you want to have intercourse. Um, With that being said, from a risk standpoint, um, bruising, uh, painful erections can happen. Scarring could happen as well. Um, Most importantly is you'll hear the commercials about if your erection lasts more than four hours. Well, these medications can do that. So we got to be a little bit cautious with how we administer those medications because they can keep your erection going much, much longer than it would be comfortable, believe me. Um, so that's something that, that is, a, is a drawback, particularly unique to those drugs. Uh, the benefit of the medications, honestly, really, it's, it's the rigidity, the ability to get a, that good enough erection. So, you know, guys who are a little bit gun shy about the possibility of doing surgery, for example, um, you know, they may say, you know, doc, really, I want to I wanna try to manage it with these shots. And, and, and they can be very effective. And let's move on to vacuum erection devices. Can you tell us the risk and benefits with that? Well, you know, I'll tell you, the, the, the benefits briefly is that it's, uh, it's cheap and effective. The drawbacks. I had a patient one time tell me that, and this is a great analogy, he said, you know, Doc, the erection you get from the, imp, from the vacuum pump, he said, it's like a Christmas tree in a room without a stand. He goes, it's erect, but the bottom of it needs some support. And that's because the blood's drawn into the penis, and then you wrap a very tight constriction band on the base of the penis to keep the blood in. I'll tell you, if anybody's seen those constriction bands, we're not talking about a loosely fitting, you know, rubber band. We're talking about a pretty tight band around the penis that can result in things like penile swelling, bruising, and even a kind of a cold to touch erection because you're sort of choking the blood off and keeping it in there. So while vacuum pumps are cheap and easy and and do play a role in my practice, mostly in a rehabilitation standpoint, um, but while they're, while they're there, they're, they're not necessarily my favorite option for my patients. Urethral suppositories. What are some of the risks? What are the benefits? So big thing we worry about with urethral suppositories twofold. One is the, um, it can cause some blood pressure issues. So usually in the beginning, when we first are going to try it on someone, we may do it in the office to kind of observe them. The part that I think is the most difficult is that it's uncomfortable to give, um, and oftentimes I'm suggesting to the few folks that I prescribed it to that they should wear a condom for intercourse because the medication dissolves in the urethra, but not all of it is absorbed, of course, and it starts to leach out into your spouse. And that can create irritation of the, of the tissue, um, which can be uncomfortable. So I usually suggest men who use that use a condom. Um, and it's really just not as effective as the pills. So that's the other downside is that it is, uh, you know, maybe about 65% effective. So not a very commonly prescribed drug any longer. 
And now I want to ask you about penile implants. Can you talk us through the risks and the benefits of a penile implant? I'm still trying to come up with my good acronym for um, the, what I like to say about the benefits, the rigidity, reliability, reproducibility, um, durability, and spontaneity. I'm not sure how, how to frame that yet, but those are the real major benefits, right? I'm going to get the erection I need. Um, it's going to be reliable. It's going to come when I need it. It is going to be as hard as it has to be. It's going to stay there. Um, it's going to get me through the act of intercourse. And, and by the way, believe it or not, is the most spontaneous because you're not, you know, you're not having to say, honey, give me a minute. I got to run over to the refrigerator, warm up my shot and give myself an injection and wait 20 minutes. Um, this is going to work on demand when you want it. So those are the benefits, I think, of an implant. They, they really do wind up being more, um, uh, more natural than what people would imagine. Um, the drawbacks is that, of course, it's a surgical procedure and we don't take those things lightly, right? This is the difference between all the rest uh, are these treatment options is that, yes, it is a fix, but it involves a surgical procedure on a delicate area of our body. Um, and there are risks that come with that, you know, whether it's risks of bleeding or infection, um, the latter of which infection is you know, still fairly rare, um, but... Not, un not completely unheard of, maybe a 1% to 2% chance. Um, certainly, diabetics or folks that are more at risk for infections to begin with, we got to watch out for. Uh, but those are risks that can be associated with an implant. The other thing is, you know, with a device, they've done research studies that well over 90% of patients and their spouses are satisfied with the implant, uh, both in the way it works and how it's restored their function. But it's not... 100%. So there are, you know, less than 5% of folks, but there are some people who are just unhappy with it, whether it is, you know, just, you know, difficulties managing and, and using it, whether, whether it's kind of sore or uncomfortable. There are those folks, again, minority of folks is not many of them, but there are some people who have those issues. So I do take very seriously the conversation I have with my patients who are implant candidates you know, we, we go through these risks pretty extensively. Bringing the conversation back to heart health, Dr. Natale, can you talk us through some simple ways to improve heart health through maybe making some better lifestyle choices? Absolutely. I, I um, I'm going to share my personal journey because I think that it's important to understand that when I'm, when I'm with my patients, you really, really, truly am trying to give them, be their partner, Right. And in understanding what I've gone through in my lifetime is important. Um, two things. One is that I was diagnosed with low testosterone about three years ago and have been on, on a medication to help me boost that level to get my energy levels back, my interests, my all, all the things that testosterone provides for us. So I understand the impact that something like that has on our health. I was about 55 pounds heavier than I am now um, and just you know, was not doing well in terms of, of exercise and eating well and, and treating my body right. Um, and what I was afraid of was that I was on a cruise control kind of course into heart disease and erectile dysfunction, all these other things that could happen. And I made that change in my life. And the change wasn't easy. It was a, a real alt alteration of who I was. I mean, I've, you know, been a particular way for so long. Hard work um, with eating right and exercise and diet have helped me get to where I'm at and treating my other issues, all the rest. I think it's so important that I emphasize that to my patients because it's not that all hope is lost, right? If you do those things, you know, even at a 45 year old guy who's busy and works, you know, hours on end, it's doable. We can do it. You lose that weight, you quit smoking, um, maybe you drink a little bit too much or whatever the circumstance, you're stressed out. Uh, working on those things to help improve your life will have a downstream effect. And if it's making your, if you're making your penis happier, right? If your things are doing well, we're also knowing we're making our heart happier and vice versa. So all of those things to lead a better lifestyle um, is so, so, so key. Um, and it's, it's not a replacement of those other things you just talked about. It's something I use in conjunction with the therapies that we just discussed to give my guys the best outcomes. Great. I really appreciate that storytelling and telling us about your own journey with, 
with physical health. And I just want to know if you have any other final thoughts before we wrap up here, talking erectile dysfunction, heart health, men's health. What do you got for us? I, you know, tell this story to patients very frequently, um, which is this. Every October, um, we watch players in the NFL, a sport played mostly by men, right? Um, Watched mostly by men. We watch them and we realize that in October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We get guys wearing pink out on the fields as they should. They're champions for their moms, for their spouses. The next month, no one really knows what that is. No one knows what the color is. It's blue. It's blue for prostate cancer. And I say that because I realize that there, we need, as men, a voice too. Our health are the important things that we need to take care of. They're equally important to those that are sisters, our moms, our, our daughters, our wives. It's important too, right? We need, to, we need to focus on that. And I think that having a physician to be a men's health advocate, to really promote those things, to speak for, for those folks, to bring that to the forefront, let's address these issues together is really, really key. Um, and it's you know an honor to be able to do that for my patients. And, and I really take that, that job very, very, very seriously. Um, I want people to get the best out of their lives and to come out from the shadows, talk about those issues that affect them so we can work together. So I think that, you know, the, the kind of take home message is find the right doctor, work well with that person, um, you know, be honest, open, have a good communication. And they're going to they're going to get you to where you need to be and help help you address and fix those problems. So that's that's my take home message for for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Dr. Richard Natale. He is a urologist and men's health specialist in the Charlotte, North Carolina region. He's with Carolina Urology Partners, and you can learn more about him at charlottemenshealth.com.